listening to Appalachian Words, the show about language in Appalachia. I'm your host, Jennifer Heinmiller. I am the co-author of the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English, a historical dictionary that is over 1.3 million words long, covers all sorts of words from Appalachia, from Adam's house cat to Zigarboo to my personal favorite, Circumvengimus. If you're curious about any of those, especially that last one, subscribe and tune in. Appalachian English is a rich language with a history stretching back hundreds of years. But outside of the region, there are more stereotypes than honest conversation about the culture. So in an effort to bring this language and its history and the culture to a wider audience, I decided to start this show. For each episode, if you're a regular listener, you know, I'll be reading and discussing entries in the dictionary and highlighting Appalachian culture and history, as well as talking about how the dictionary is set up, the process of compiling it and editing it. And as always, I welcome your questions, comments, stories, or any other message you'd like to send. Um, Please keep it nice (laughs) if I can throw in a request there. Anyway, welcome back. Welcome back to the mountains and the foothills of Appalachia. You are listening to episode eight, where we're going to talk about springtime. So it's been, as they say in the mountains, a coon's age (laughs) since I produced a new episode. And I had every intention of doing some holiday episodes and some episodes early this year, Valentine's Day, etc., etc. And well, the best laid plans, right? (laughs) You know how that goes. Um, Especially anybody listening Right now, when I'm recording in the spring of 2020, the best laid plans. We know what happens to those. Um, So that being said, I hope you're all well. Um, And uh, getting through this very interesting situation. Um, Let's just keep cruising through it and keep our eyes on the mountains. Please don't come to the mountains. (laughs) I welcome everyone here any other time. Any other time, honestly. Um, But hopefully I can bring the mountains to you if you're not already here. Um, anyway, so I have gotten some emails from several folks lately, and that has been a lot of fun. So thank you to everyone who has written in. I really love hearing from you. Um, and I am really excited to be putting out another episode and thank you. Thank you for tuning back in after the prolonged and unannounced hiatus. Um, I do have a bit of an announcement a bit, actually a huge announcement. So part of the reason that this year I've been uh, lax on producing episodes is because I have been busy with other parts of the dictionary, um, namely sending it to publication. So if you have been following the show, um, I've mentioned the University of North Carolina Press in the past and mentioned in a roundabout way maybe that I was in talks with them. Well, I have big news. The dictionary is currently under contract with the University of North Carolina Press. Shout out. Uh, The team there is amazing and we are working very hard to get this thing published. Uh, The manuscript has been submitted and accepted and officially approved. So we're still kind of, you know, murky about a publication date, especially given everything that's going on right now. But, but tentatively, we're looking at having the new dictionary in our hands and on shelves next spring. So I hope you'll all stay tuned, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, and look forward to that. Um, So this time next year, we may have this thing on our desks, on our shelves, uh, hopefully not being used as a doorstop, but uh, it would be effective for that (laughs) because it's going to be huge. Um, Anyway, so... Back to today and springtime. Believe it or not, spring is here. We may not all be spending it in the way we had planned or we wanted to, but it is here nonetheless. I haven't been out a lot in the last month, as I'm sure many of you haven't. Uh, But even on my little street here in Asheville, the flowers and trees have been just blooming and things have been greening up. I've always loved spring. Um, And if you've spent much time in the Southern Appalachians, you know that springtime gives fall a run for its money as the most beautiful season here. There's just flowers everywhere. So for this episode, I wanted to bring a little bit of that freshness and uh, beauty and a little taste of the mountains to you. So like a lot of the region, springtime is when things seem to get really started in Western North Carolina. 
It seems like every weekend, in a typical year that is, there's about 45 festivals, gallery walks, shows, dances, 5Ks, or workshops you can choose from. And being an artist myself, I love the gallery walks. Highly recommend those. Um, Asheville is just such a great place for that. If you've ever been here, I'm sure you know. Um, so, yeah, when the time comes again. All right, all right. I swore to myself I wouldn't get melancholy or dwell too much on the current situation because um, we're here to talk about history and the beauty of Appalachia. So let's let's stick with that. We know what our lives are like right now. So let's just talk about springtime. Um, so just looking at things greening up, I just feel like there's something innately hopeful in watching spring unfold. Um, I guess I'm not doing such a great job at staying away from current events. Oh well. Um, but I do like to hold on to that hope. I think anything that gives us hope and a little beauty right now is something we should really hold on to. Um, and the earth moves on and things will rebalance. And I, I have faith in that. And just watching the seasons change here and watching the birds and the the abundant wildlife, even here in my, my neighborhood. I don't live in the countryside. I, I live in a fairly busy area in Asheville. Um, and it reminds me, you know, things will rebalance. The animals have no idea what's going on. You see these birds and it's business as usual, which is comforting, I think. It gives a great sense of continuity. Um, and it's also interesting just to look at an ecological perspective, how much emissions are down right now. And of course it's terrible for the economy, but if there are silver linings, that would be it, um, or one of them. Um, the Great Smoky Mountains, if you're not aware, one of the reasons they're called the Great Smoky Mountains and why there's kind of a haze is the geography keeps a lot of the emissions from vehicle traffic trapped there. So unfortunately, that haze is really not always a good thing, uh, especially as vehicle traffic and tourism has increased exponentially over the past decades. Um, and the air quality typically is not great uh, in the Smokies. I, I hate to uh, break that to anyone who was under a different impression. But this year, the air quality may well be uh, something that we haven't seen in many decades uh, because of the the far fewer number of cars <laughs> not being very eloquent about this but i'm sure you know what i mean um but it's yeah it's interesting i think i've seen more wild turkeys right here in my neighborhood in the past two weeks than in the total year and a half that i've lived in this house and um and it's all around the world too i actually heard that in wales uh, in the uk where the restrictions are quite a bit tighter than here in north carolina uh, people can't go out and about much, um, if I understand correctly. Uh, if, if you're there and it's different, correct me if I'm wrong. But apparently, <laughs> recently, some little town in Wales was overrun by goats. <laughs> so I don't know if nature's reclaiming things already, which is kind of frightening, but also kind of funny. You got to laugh about it, right? Um, and I can't say that would be entirely surprising if it were to happen in one of our little mountain communities around here. We do have a good number of goats in these parts. Well, anyway, I thought I would start off with uh, one of the signs of spring weather uh, that we get here in the mountains, especially in the upper elevations. Um, and this is a fresh or a spring fresh. And in the mountain dialect, sometimes it's pronounced fresh. So this is a sudden surge of water in a stream. So we're talking about a flash flood, especially uh, after springtime rains or when you get the snow melt. Um, this can also be called a freshet or a may fresh uh, or spring fresh, as I mentioned. And we have a lot of evidence for this term going back to 1805. Um, we have a record from a church when someone reported no meeting upon the account of a very wet day and a very great frish in the night. And in this case, it's spelled F-R-I-S-H, frish. So we have a number of pronunciations going on here. And that church was located in East Tennessee. Um, I say it was. It may still exist. I'm actually not sure about that. I'll have to look that up. 
Um, but then we have um, some other evidence from elsewhere. So we have Burke County, North Carolina. The letter miscarried at the time of the last fresh, and that's from 1834. Um, and then we have some more documentation from more recently, 1985, well, <laughs> sort of recent, um, where the author writes, many times flash floods or freshes, as the old folks sometimes called them, would come on warm spring days. And you'd have to be careful about these, definitely. A little bit dangerous. Um, but another thing that happens after the snow melts and comes along with the spring freshes is a very illustrative way of describing what happens around here as spring comes to the mountains. And that is come grass uh, or just grass. So I don't think we ever quite lose the green grass here in Asheville where I am, uh, at least not in recent years, but I know other places, northern Appalachia and the higher elevations, of course. I know they get a little gray and brown for several months out of the year. Um, so it's it's a great way to describe things. Um, so we have a great quote from 1913, Horace Keppert. I've mentioned his works um, in the past. So he says, you remember the big storm three year ago, come grass, when the cattle all huddled up atop of each other and frizz in one pile solid. Well, it's not a very cheerful um, <laughs> quote there, um, but it is it is interesting and it tells us a lot about how the weather will go back and forth, which we're experiencing now. One day, you know, it'll be 86. I think just last weekend, I think we hit 88. And then we had a low down around 40 degrees a few days later, but you know that's how it goes in the mountains. Um, but we also have another phrase, which I think I may have used off the cuff earlier, uh, green up. And this is pretty self-explanatory, but that you know, it's used as a verb typically uh, in the United States all over. The way that I used it, things start to green up. Um, that's a verb phrase. But in the Appalachian Mountains, we have it as a noun phrase. So green up, it just means springtime. And we have a lot of evidence for this. Um, so from a wonderful blog called The Blind Pig and Acorn. If you haven't checked out this blog, I highly recommend it. Uh, all things Appalachia. Uh, the author even throws in some music here and there. But she wrote, Every spring I wish I could put my finger on the exact moment green up magically occurs. I know it's not an instantaneous thing. Instead, it happens in small increments until finally it arrives. I think that's just such a beautiful quote. Um, and it can be used figuratively for a lot of things. Um, and we have another quote here from 1991. Springtime, just at green up time, was the time for making pop guns and willow whistles. Their bark gets loose, um, which is really interesting to me. If you're listening to this episode and you know what a willow whistle is, uh, drop me a line. I'm really curious about this. And I don't think it's in any other documentation that I'm familiar with. Um, but I'd, I'd like to know. I can, you know, I have some ideas what it might refer to. I'm not exactly sure. When I was a kid, my family moved around quite a bit. But one of our houses uh, had this enormous weeping willow tree in the front yard right next to a creek. And my brother and I, I remember this, when we were in elementary school, we would break off those long, flimsy branches, you know, from weeping willows, and we would soak them in the creek, and then we'd try to hit each other with them. And we called those willow whips, and <laughs> I don't think this was dialect at all. Um, I think it was just our own stupidity, quite honestly. <laughs> I certainly hope there are no children listening and getting ideas. Um, I don't recommend that game. It hurts, like... Hurts like the Dickens. Anyway, uh, so moving on. A lot of cultures, not just in Appalachia or even the U.S., but around the world. Um, we have spring rituals and different things to mark the time of the year. Our calendar new year, of course, is January. But spring kind of feels like a new year in itself. It's when life returns. Um, and in the Appalachian Mountains, people get excited about different foods and plants that will appear. And one of the things that people especially seem to get excited about 
is hickory chickens, which is not a bird, but a type of wild mushroom. So these would typically appear in the springtime, and one of the most loved ways to prepare them is fried in butter. And it's apparently quite a treat. Um, and from what I have researched, it seems that the original settlers um, learned about the hickory chicken mushroom from the Cherokee, who also really love it. Um, and even now, if you go foraging or hiking, sometimes you'll see these things. They're kind of fluffy looking. Um, I wouldn't say they look like a chicken to me, maybe if you squint really hard. <laughs> uh, but you can still see them in the woods. And I believe there are actually some groups uh, in Western North Carolina, at least, and I'm sure other areas that go out foraging for mushrooms and things. I mean, of course, you don't want to be doing that if you don't really have a grasp on what you're doing, because we do have poisonous mushrooms uh, in this area. But there are groups that do it, and uh, there are some companies that do foraging tours if you're interested in such a thing. Uh, but anyway, so hickory chicken, we have this in the dictionary, and we define it as an edible mushroom, so-called from its taste and its tendency to grow under hickory trees. No big surprise there. Um, so we have a few quotes here from 1979. When he was a young man, he called them hickory chickens. This, she said, was because they grew under hickory trees in a damp area. And then from 2007, the book My Appalachia, one of the treats of springtime in the mountains was when dad found hickory chickens and brought them home. I asked him once why he called them hickory chickens. I usually find them growing under hickory trees, he said, and the way your mama fixes them, they taste just like chicken, only better. So that, that sounds pretty enticing to me. Um, a mushroom that tastes like chicken. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that. If you've eaten one, uh, again, drop me a line. I'd, I'd love to hear about that or other types of mushrooms. I'm a little bit uh, too nervous to forage for my own mushrooms, but the culture of it uh, really interests me. It's very interesting. Um, so besides hickory chicken, sometimes these same mushrooms are referred to as dry land fish, which is really intriguing. Um, I wonder if some people prepare them in a way that makes them taste like fish. I don't really have any more information on that. Um, but they're also called uh, markles and Bigfoot, <laughs> which is great. Appalachia and many other places uh, have the tradition of spring cleaning, of course. Um, well, hey, another silver lining of staying home in this season is plenty of opportunity to do our spring cleaning, am I right? <laughs> Maybe not so much. Um, anyway, in Appalachia, after a long winter of eating mostly preserved foods or dried fruits or uh, very little fresh or, you know, food that has much nutritional value, uh, people would feel a little lethargic, understandably. And even now, you know, I think a lot of us do just kind of coming out of hibernation, so to speak. Um, but the people in the mountains would concoct these tonics to supposedly start moving their blood and uh, they thought that these tonics would actually cleanse the blood or cleanse the body from the inside out. So I'm not recommending this in any way and I, I can't speak to their efficacy, but we actually have quite a lot of evidence of drinks like this. So tonic, uh, which is also called spring tonic, in the dictionary it's under just tonic, um, we have a great quote about how some of these were prepared. So from 1975, springtime in the mountains was synonymous with tonics for everybody in the mountain family. Purifiers, they were called. Cherry bark bitters mixed with whiskey was not one of their favorites, <laughs> along with a host of other bitter teas. Red sassafras tea was one purifier and blood thinner that stood out from all the others and was usually relished by the family when sweetened with honey or sugar. Some preferred spice wood tea, but sassafras was the favorite, and some drank it year round. And it was interesting reading this because I remember um, when I was a kid, I lived in uh, Louisville, Kentucky for a while, and sassafras tea was pretty popular there. 
So that may well be a holdover um, from, you know, the people who moved westward from eastern Kentucky. I don't think I've seen it in recent years in the Carolinas, but, you know, come to think of it, I do remember enjoying uh, sassafras tea, iced tea, of course, sweetened, you know, as a kid, I loved it, uh, sweetened quite a bit, uh, not with whiskey or anything bitter mixed into it. I've never tasted anything like that. Um, and so tonic can also be used, uh, not only as a noun, but as a verb. And this means to treat with a potion intended to relieve or rejuvenate. Um, we have a couple of older quotes uh, for this, we have a great one in particular, which is um, a transcription of a conversation. It's it's quite heavy on the dialect pronunciation, the I dialect, as we call it in linguistics, where the words are written the way that they're pronounced, um, which is difficult for me since it's not my native dialect. But the quote goes, I always say when a body gets fevered up, it takes a lot of tonic in on good yarb tea and such, and a plenty of it to bring them out. So yarb tea is going to be herb tea. Yarb is actually one of the old pronunciations of herb, which would refer to any sort of plant used for medicinal purposes, excuse me, um, found in the mountains. And there were a lot, there are a lot of them, and people still use them to this day, um, including things like ginseng, uh, people actually still go ginseng hunting today, although it is illegal in most areas. Um, but yeah, the biodiversity in Appalachia provides so many plants with uh, various medicinal uses. So um, moving on here, we also have uh, another plant that is referred to as tonic root sometime. Uh, and this is more commonly known as golden seal. So this one, it's used up there along with uh, ginseng, sassafras. Um, and we have some quotes um, from 1968. Best known as sang sign is the golden seal. Um, and then they also refer to it later in the book as tonic root. And golden seal and sassafras and a lot of these other medicinal plants were also referred to as blood builders. Um, and in an earlier quote, we had uh, the phrasing about a blood thinner, um, which you know may or may not be true. Again, a lot of these do have very strong medicinal uses and purposes. Um, but a blood tonic, blood builder um, would also uh, include, um, well, many things, many things, and often included a little bit of whiskey in there. Um, so we have a great explanation. Blood medicine, yet another term for it, is a mixture of many herbs boiled or steeped together. Um, still used uh, today as of 1997. And we have two speakers from that same year who said uh, blood builder was sassafras and the other one swore up and down it was ginseng. So. Uh, even within the region, there were many variations for these terms and uses. Um, another great explanation we have from the book Folk Medicine, published in 2003. In the spring, the blood's invigorating properties were restored by taking a tonic, variously called a blood builder, blood restorer, blood toner, or spring tonic. The most popular tonic in southern Appalachia was sulfur and molasses, which some thought was good for cleaning the blood. So there we have something completely different. Uh, molasses was one of your typical sweeteners in Appalachia. Um, and yeah, sulfur and molasses, that's a very classic one. And even now, um, you'll see blackstrap molasses at health stores um, or like the health food section of some grocery stores um, to be used as a, a supplement. So moving away from the tonics and the medicinal uses, um, as I mentioned before, the weather kind of bounces back and forth. Summer one day, winter the next, and that's kind of, you take the average and that, that evens out to springtime in the mountains. Um, and this has long been a pattern, uh, going back hundreds of years. And so we have a bunch of different names for these cold snaps that occur when going by the calendar, you would think it would be nice and sunny and calm. 
Um, so one of the most popular is Blackberry Winter. And in the dictionary, we call this uh, a late frost or period of freezing weather, especially in May when the blackberries have already begun to bloom. It kills buds, blossoms, and new plantings. And then there are a bunch of variants for this type of phenomenon. Uh, Catbird winter, dog, excuse me, dogwood winter, Easter winter, fox grape winter, martin winter, red bud winter, service winter, sick bird winter, whippoorwill winter, and white oak winter. All right, so um, for these terms, we have a lot of quotes. Back to 1913, we have, at their blooming time in April or early May comes a cold storm called the Blackberry Blossom Storm. As a similar spell of bad weather in the north when the apple trees are out is called the Apple Blossom Storm. I'm kind of curious about uh, which part of the north they're referring to here. Um, I've never heard it. I've spent um, several years in part of the north, <laughs> Ohio, Pennsylvania. Um, I haven't heard it, but then again, I've also never lived on a farm. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. Uh, but then we have 1918 from North Carolina. Blackberry winter is a cold weather, a period of cold weather in spring when blackberries are already in bloom. Uh, 1940, from West Virginia, uh, the Charleston Gazette had an article that said Charleston's Blackberry summer weather continued last night after the temperature had hit a low of 46 degrees. Unseasonal coolness at the time of the summer solstice's beginning was given the name Blackberry summer when old timers in the Virginian, Virginias, interesting, noted that this brand of weather seemed to hit the same time summer blackberries are best. It's fascinating. That article is from June 23rd. Yeah, pardon me for tripping over my words there. Um, but then we also have 1952, back to North Carolina. Uh, blackberry storm, again, is the cold season that sometimes comes when blackberries are in bloom. Um, and then 1962, after the cold spell when dogwoods bloomed, there would be whippoorwill winter and blackberry winter. Dogwood winter happens in April, but it is soon followed by another spell of cold called blackberry winter, which occurs in May when blackberry briars put out their delicate flowers. And um, yeah, speaking of dogwood, I guess it is about the time when dogwoods will be coming into bloom. I always thought that was such a pretty tree and it just makes me think of Easter, you know? Some other plants we have uh, are yellow bell, which is the name uh, regionally used for the forsythia. It is also called Easter bush. Um, so much like the dogwood, it's one of those plants that kind of goes hand in hand with our Easter traditions, if that's something you practice. But um, there are many Easter traditions throughout uh, the mountains. Uh, and along with that, we also have the alleluia, uh, which is the common wood sorrel, also the same as mountain shamrock, mountain sorrel, sheep sorrel, and wood shamrock. Um, and to be honest, uh, before I began work on the dictionary, I didn't know any of these. I think it's kind of indicative of the fact that we just don't really know much about plants these days. Uh, you know, not unless you're especially into botany or perhaps you live somewhere in the countryside. Um, but we do have a lot of quotes for this one as well. Uh, we have white wood sorrel in 1901. Even in some places it is known by the delightful name of Alleluia. Um, and there's a note here that said perhaps so called because it flowers during the Easter season. Um, along those same lines we have an entry for Easter flower which can actually refer to a number of different flowers. Uh, including the daffodil. Um, in 1960, we have Wilson writing, Easter flower is daffodil, also called buttercups or cups and saucers or March flowers. So that really shows you which latitude he was living in because here in Asheville, I think we had our daffodils in full bloom in February, at least this year. Um, so probably dependent on which year as well. Um, but then you also have Easter flower referring to gravel weed, 
another one that you don't really hear much about. Uh, but in 1939, the book Flora of the Great Smokies, we have on dry hillsides in out of the way places, the trailing arbutus or Easter flower, as the mountain man calls it, may be found. And then to talk just a little bit about Easter, we're just about a week away from Easter now, hard to believe. Um, I ran across this kind of interesting uh, tradition or game that kids would play uh, in Appalachia on Easter, um, which was called egg fighting uh, or a rooster fight, which um, I don't think, I hope it had nothing to do with a rooster. Not that I'm finding. This is a different use of the phrase rooster fight. But egg fighting, we have a description of this game in 1964. A popular Easter game among the young people was called picking eggs or egg fighting. A person selected what he considered to be his strongest egg and challenged someone else to, quote, pick against him. The eggs were tapped against each other until one of the shells cracked. Then the owner of the other egg claimed the cracked one as prize. And then 2002, similarly, um, the next and most physical, sometimes even violent, <laughs> event of Easter festivities began to unfold. Violent. These were the notorious Easter egg, quote, rooster fights. Um, and this person writes, two contestants took eggs in hand and held them a few inches apart. On cue, they proceeded to thump them sharply against each other. If there was no damage to either egg, the process was repeated. Um, the person whose egg cracked first, aka the cracky E, was the loser and forfeited said egg to the holder of the uncracked egg, aka the crack er. What made this smackdown egg competition even more exhilarating was that they almost always wound up uh, in set twos betwixt crack curs and crack ease. Um, I don't know that exhilarating <laughs> seems like the most obvious choice of word for this contest to me, but um, hey, to each his own. Different times, different folks. <laughs> if you've ever done a contest like this, let me know. And I'm also curious if you have participated in an egg fight or rooster fight in this sense. Um, do you use hard boiled eggs or do you use regular eggs? If you use like raw regular eggs, I imagine this would get pretty nasty pretty quick. Um, hence the violence, perhaps, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but a little nicer, a little nicer. We have uh, a nice phrase, set your cap. And this phrase is typically used to mean um, get someone's attention. So setting your cap for someone means you have your eye on them. Like, oh, I'm interested in this person in a romantic sense. Uh, but it's also used in the sense of young children putting their hats out to attract the attention of the Easter Bunny. Uh, from 1964, we have a great little excerpt. Young children expected a visit from the Easter rabbit on Easter morn, so they, quote, set their caps or bonnets in which they expected the rabbit would lay some eggs. The boys placed their caps and the girls their bonnets under the kitchen chair or table before they went to bed on Easter Eve. In the morning, a cluster of hard-cooked colored eggs would be found in the bonnets or caps. It's very similar to the Christmas stocking. Um, and it's also interesting to me that in this quotation, uh, the author calls it Easter Eve, which is not something widely used. I don't think I've ever heard it in my family. Um, if you use this or you've heard it, uh, let me know. I wonder if there are Easter Eve traditions that certain families may have. All right, well, I am running a little long on time this time. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in and bearing with me as I get my podcasting feet back. Uh, despite the stumbles and the very long hiatus, but um, stick around, uh, stay tuned in for updates and a new episode very soon. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about planting, although of course if there are topics from Appalachia that you are especially interested in and you'd like to hear me talk about, feel free to drop me a line and I will definitely take those into consideration. In the meantime, have a wonderful Easter, enjoy springtime, uh, stay home, be safe, Take care.